Hello. Good afternoon, Korea. 안녕하세요. Great to see everyone. How was lunch? Delicious. Okay. So while you're digesting your food, I will tell you about the crypto scene in China, and hopefully you can keep your food down. Okay, good. Uh, it's my first time here in Korea to give a speech about Bitcoin, blockchain, and crypto. Very happy to be here. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about, my background is of course in BTC China, BTCC, the first uh, Bitcoin exchange in China. And uh, we had to close it down last year in December, sorry, in September of 2017. So I'm here to talk about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in China from the past to now and the future. Are you guys excited about that? Okay. Who, who has traded on a Chinese Bitcoin exchange? Anyone? A few people. All of you trade on Korean exchanges? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Uh, let's see if this works. Uh-oh. The clicker is not working. Okay, let's start over. It's almost like a slideshow. Okay, Bitcoin and uh, what is China's role in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? So China is actually crazy about cryptocurrency. As, as many of you know, it started many years ago. BTC China started in uh, 2011. And there's going to be more crypto mining in China despite the fact that the exchanges have shut down. And the reason mining is so popular, and it has, by the way, has huge, it still has a huge portion of the global market share. And the reason is that it's a free lottery, okay, to get bitcoins. People like to make money in China. Did you know that? I don't know about in Korea, but people really like to make money. There's a lot of availability of supplies of equipment, mining machines, and most importantly, they get a lot of cheap electricity. And when I say cheap, sometimes they even get it for free. They find their way to get electricity for free. And of course, down the road, there's going to be more, continues to be more crypto trading. So despite the fact that trading has essentially stopped officially on exchanges last year, as you know, the PBOC and regulators asked all tokens and ICOs to be unwound, and they also stopped all Bitcoin exchanges last fall. Uh, however, Bitcoin trading, crypto trading is still happening in China. So let me first tell you the reasons. The two, the, there's three ways, there's three main reasons why people in China trade crypto. Number one is for investment. People have a lot of excess capital. There's a lack of good investment venues. So they, they invest their savings, high savings rate. They invest their savings in long term. These are people holding it. The second thing is they trade it for speculation reasons. So these are the, the day traders, and they, um, they, they trade in and out. They trade the tokens, they trade cryptos, they trade altcoins, they trade scam coins, you know, a lot of shit coins they trade as well, as long as the price is going to go up. For them, it's a good, good trade. So this is for earning money, okay? Again, very much about the, the entrepreneurial spirit, about capitalism, about raising, uh, earning money. And the third reason is similar to the first two, and it's just pure gambling. And the reason I say it's three reasons, because in, in the end, it's, it's sort of the line is blurred. What is an investment to you may be perceived as speculation to someone else. So it turns out that investment speculation, it's actually in the eye of the beholder. It's very subjective. What I consider to be a safe investment, someone might think, Bobby, you're gambling, okay? But how do they do it today? All the exchanges are closed down, Many exchanges have moved abroad to other countries like Korea, like Japan. And what they do now is they're actually these underground services where you could, buy, you could use renminbi in China and buy what they call USDT tokens, USDT credit. So this is the USDT token, but they get credit on another exchange. So you pay this person, it's sort of this money changer. You pay them renminbi either by cash or by bank transfer. And then you tell them your account number, and then they will give you USDT in the account. And from that account, you can then buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all other tokens. So that's still happening very much. And when they cash out, same thing. When you have um, 
crypto on a certain exchanges that have affiliations with China, you would sell it into USDT and then you cash that out and they give you renminbi. So there's an underground economy of crypto trading. Okay, so the, the third use case people talk about is for capital controls. So what I'm here to tell you is that cryptocurrency is actually not about evading capital controls. Okay, may, some of you may think so. Let me, let me see the audience. How many of you think that cryptocurrencies is used for capital controls, evading capital controls? Yes, are you guys, are you the ones doing it? <laughs> yeah, but, but Korea also has a uh, capital controls. Is that right? Is, is it very strict? Very strict? How much per year? US dollars? That's it? Okay, same in China, 50,000. So I'm gonna tell you about why for a Bitcoin exchange, actually buying and selling Bitcoin is not about evading capital controls. Because first of all, let's understand, the main reason countries and governments have capital controls is to control and limit their foreign, limit exposure to their foreign currency reserves. So every major country, uh, you know, like Korea, China, would have these large, large foreign currency reserves, right? You know, in China, it's like two, two trillion dollars, two, three trillion dollars. And what they worry is, if you go to the bank with a lot of renminbi, or in this case, Korean won, and you change it all to US dollar, then it depletes the foreign currency reserve that the country has, okay? It, it took the country many years to build up the foreign currency reserves, and the current foreign currency reserves actually make the currency strong. So they want to, prevent a sort of mass withdrawal of foreign currencies from the country. And many of the poorer countries, like in Latin America and Africa, actually have small reserves, and for them it's even more important to have capital controls. But my point here is that for a Bitcoin exchange, buying and selling Bitcoin does not do damage, does not negatively impact the foreign currency reserves. And here's how I do it. I'm gonna show you a diagram, a photograph of an airport. And what happens in airports is planes land and planes take off, right? If I told you, oh my gosh, yesterday from Seoul Incheon Airport, 75 planes took off yesterday, another 72 planes took off the day before, and today there's gonna be 80 planes that take off. What do you think? Would you be scared that, oh my gosh, all the planes are leaving Korea, there's gonna be no more planes left? Is that the reaction? Well, it turns out that's not the case. So capital flight is like planes taking off. So for example, in China, if you have 10 million renminbi, I hope you see the font, and people purchase Bitcoin with these 10 million renminbi, and then they take the Bitcoin, they sell it in the United States or in Europe for US dollar or Euro. But the truth is, at the same time they purchase the Bitcoin, just like when every plane that takes off, the planes actually land before it takes off. So same thing, on a Bitcoin exchange, when you purchase a Bitcoin, the actual Bitcoin actually come in to the exchange before, it takes, before you purchase it. So someone put in the Bitcoin first, and then actually that person will take the 10 million RMB that you purchased, and they now have the 10 million RMB. So the, the money actually still stays in the country, it stays in the same banking system in Korea and China. So for that reason, Bitcoin purchases are trade neutral and does not affect the foreign currency reserves. Especially, and most important, when it's done on an exchange. Okay, so Bitcoin in the end, for the Chinese people, is actually money in the cloud. It's a digital asset in the cloud, in the blockchain, and it's actually the ultimate hard currency. For many uh, people, you know, I grew up in Africa, in the Ivory Coast, and I witnessed firsthand what it means for the importance of a hard currency, when the local currency is very shaky or very unreliable in terms of the value. It's important for people to hold their value, not just in the local currency, but in the hard currency, like the US dollar, the euro. Now, in some cases, the renminbi as well. But in the end, I truly think that Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, backed by mathematics and the blockchain, is the ultimate, ultimate hard currency. Now, I would prefer to ask to be paid in Bitcoin. I don't know about you. So, Bitcoin is about investing in the future. It's about the notion, the future, in the future world, that the world we're moving into now in the 21st century, 
is a world of digital assets, a world of online commerce, a world of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So when people like us, our generation, when we hold Bitcoin and digital currencies and crypto, we are betting on the future. The notion that with digital currencies, the ownership is by the information, by the knowledge of the private key that I keep secret on my USB drive, on my hardware wallet, on my Bitcoin D, or even a paper backup. It's a new revolutionary global asset class that's truly different. In the past, whether it's gold, physical ownership, or money in banks, stocks, bonds, those are all traditional asset classes like real estate and other precious metals. But for crypto, it's a new asset class. It's an asset class based on information. Okay? So it's a digital asset class for a digital age. And since you're all here at the Blockchain Open Forum conference, I suspect that many of you agree with me and now you own a portion of your net assets in crypto. Is that right? Yeah. So, and that's not, and today probably maybe half of you might own crypto, but tomorrow, in five years, 10 years, and in 20 years, when our children grow up and when our children have grandchildren, I think that will be a time just like today, everybody has bank accounts, everyone has credit cards. For them, everyone will have crypto. And I don't care if it's Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, all the other tokens, and Litecoin. But the truth is, I truly believe that down the road, everyone will have crypto. And this will happen not just in Korea, it will happen in China for sure. It will happen globally in all the corners of Earth, even in South, South uh, Antarctica, South Pole. So a brief history of Bitcoin in China, I'm going to talk about through the, the lens of prices. This will give you, this will give us a history of where the prices come in and go on. In the early days when BTC China first launched in June of 2011, the first trade was exactly at 100 RMB. So it popped up a little bit to 140 RMB. The scale on the left is in RMB prices, which is about 6.6 .6 RMB per one US dollar. And it went down to as low as under 20 renminbi, about 14 renminbi. So if people bought Bitcoin in November or December of 2011, that was the cheapest. That's about $2, okay, less than $2. And then went up again. So essentially for the first year, for the first two years, it traded sideways, what I call like a smiley face, just like a small curve, okay? And the question is what's gonna happen after 2012? As you know, in 2013, that's when the first price rally. And this is actually, the price bump is actually in April of 2013. This is when I got involved with BTC China. So it went up 20x. It went to over, I think, 265 US dollars on MT Gox, about 2,000 renminbi, and then came back down a bit. And that was a huge increase. So what's gonna happen is you'll see this pattern where the next six months, the same year, 2013, so previously, the, the green line is where the height of the previous chart was. So that big rally in April is now very, very short. It's just a small, uh, much lower. So by, by November, December of 2013, prices went to as high as six, 7,000 RMB, over $1,200 US, okay, and again, a small curve and then went up, this time it went up four times, five times in price. Okay, now the big bear market, of course, we all know the Bitcoin winter in China suffered Bitcoin winter, and that was from 2014 to 2015. Again, two years, it traded sideways, okay? Went up and the pattern continued. Again, another smiley face and what happens after that? Well, I, I knew all along it's gonna, it's gonna repeat itself. That's why I got into the industry. I knew that's gonna go up again and of course, we just don't know when. And of course, by 2016, the great bull market of 2017, again, the chart, the green line is where the height of the previous chart. So what was these sm big U's are now small bumps. So that very first April of 2013, that's just a small bump now. And of course, at the end of 2017, it went up to over 33,000 renminbi, which is 5,000 US dollars. And that's even that's not the high we know, right? So you look at the 5x increase and then it actually went up much further. 
So again, now we're going to expand out to, to 10 years. And we're going to look at where Bitcoin price reached at the top, which was 20,000 US dollars. And of course, today, we're now back in that sort of smiley face, and we think it'll go higher. Okay, today we're right, we're probably right a little bit above the green line, but we are in the, the first half of that curve down. So, so if, you, if history repeats itself, we're thinking that there might be a few more months or maybe a, few, a year or two of bear market. But when it surpasses that, I think it's gonna go much, much higher. Okay? And of course in China, Bitcoin trading officially stopped. That's why we don't have any pricing data after, after that. Okay, so in China, Bitcoin was never about payments and spending. Is Bitcoin important for payments and spending here in Korea? Is it? No? People laugh in the front row. Do, have you used Bitcoin to pay for something in Korea? Anything? Well, in, in China, so I don't get a lot of responses here, but in China, it's actually not about paying and spending, okay? It's about making money. In the end, it's about investment, trading, mining, and speculation. And I think, generally speaking, this is probably true, not just in China, but also in Korea and also Asia in general. All right, so one very common question I, I get asked is, what do Chinese regulators think about Bitcoin? Do you guys want to know? So one thing I can tell you is I showed you the price charts. This is really, it's a true story. It's actually very funny to someone like me, but it's a true story. In 2013, the regulators came in because they thought the price was too high. At 6,000 renminbi, 7,000 renminbi, at 1,000 US dollars, when Bitcoin is compared to the price of gold, they thought the price was too high. That's why they came in in December to crack down. And again, end of 2016, three years later, they again thought was the price was too high. So very often the regulators have some idea of what Bitcoin price should be, and they try to you know, shake the market to make the price come back down. But as I know, I believe in free markets, I know that's just BS. It's very hard, it's, all, it's impossible to force the Bitcoin price up or down from a regulatory perspective, okay? But more importantly, these are the true challenges of the, whoops, let me go through them one by one. These are the true challenges of the regulators for China. Decentralized, Bitcoin is not a real currency. It violates foreign capital currency controls, money laundering, lack of real identity. It's used for fraud, a lot of pyramid schemes. There's hacking security risk. There's ICO regulation that needs to happen. Taxation issues, corruption and graft, speculative trading, market crashes, and of course it competes with Chinese cryptocurrencies. So these are the top, top reasons that the Chinese government cracked down on crypto, because in the end, it's just not convenient. Crypto is not convenient with the modern financial system in China, so they decide to close it and shut it down. But of course, Bitcoin was not easy to shut down. So there's a global pattern to suppress Bitcoin, and in China, this is how it happens, okay? And this is the image of the, of the, of the three monkeys. You know, you don't say anything, you, don't, you, close, you shut your ears, you shut your eyes, you pretend you don't see anything, you pretend you don't hear anything, and that's how they prefer it. So banks are, uh, the, the regulators have banned banks and payment companies from dealing with crypto and dealing with crypto companies. So there's a subversive campaign going on to stop all banks and payment companies from dealing with any company that does crypto. The second thing is they, do, they use really strict KYC and ML requirements to cash people. Okay, we know that already. And last year, they tried to regulate exchanges. In fact, last year, in, uh, at this time, in March, April, May of 2017, we were talking about regulators, and they're going to issue us a license. But the funny story is, because they did their work to come in to investigate the Bitcoin exchanges, in order for them to issue us a license, they have to find a way to penalize us. They want us to pay a penalty. And the funny thing was they even discussed with us, how much can you afford to pay a penalty? So we're negotiating what amount to pay. And uh, we got that all discussed, so I thought we were gonna get the license. Uh, and of course, they even issued us a draft of the penalty. They said, okay, this is, this is what we're gonna issue you, just so that you can share it with your shareholders to discuss if, you, if that's okay, if you can pay this amount. And we're like, yes, we'll pay the penalty to get the license. It's, um, but I talk about it now with, with a lot of fun. But uh, too bad it didn't happen last year. Uh, so, of course, in August, they started 
to talk about banning ICOs altogether and all token sales. And in September, they executed this request. They called us into the, the regulator's office. They brought the many, many departments of the PBOC, the, the financial board, the CSRC, CBRC, the Ministry of Public Security. They brought lawyers. So there was like 15 people talking to us, exchange operators. They say, here's the notice. You have to stop operating. And it was a verbal, it was a verbal request. And of course, of course, you know, we're joking, like, what if we don't stop? And they pointed to the lawyers, pointed to the police. They talk about all these other things they could do. So I know what to do. I, I, just, I just listen, I bend over, and uh, say thank you. So, um, yes. And that's why I'm here in Korea, by the way. Uh, just so you know, I, I'm very fortunate, I'm very lucky, and I'm very happy that I complied with the request. That's why I'm allowed to travel. Uh, unfortunately, many of the executives of the other Bitcoin exchanges in China did not, um, um, maybe they didn't do exactly everything they want, we were told, and many of them were actually on, you know, what they call uh, travel restrictions. They cannot leave Beijing, they cannot leave China. So it's one of those dirty secrets that people may not know about. Um, so in the end, for ICO, uh, sorry, for crypto trading, OTC tr trading, they even closed bank accounts. So we've seen this pattern where if you're OTC buyer, seller of Bitcoin, they might just close your bank account for suspecting that you're trading in crypto. So this is really bad. A lot of FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Okay, let's go faster. I'm running out of time. So why does prices keep going up? And the reason I say that Bitcoin prices does not come from the endorsement, acceptance, or regulation by government. Rather, Bitcoin's value actually comes from inherent failures, limitations, and inconvenience of the competitor, which is the fiat money system. So for all the trouble we have with fiat money system, this is actually what gives Bitcoin and crypto its price. All right, so China and the world's governments will do actually more and more to suppress Bitcoin. But the good news is Bitcoin was designed to survive. And I, I'm a strong believer in that, and we have seen that even now that China has cracked down and banned Bitcoin multiple times over the last five years. It's still thriving in China, just not in the form of centralized exchanges. So Bitcoin was designed to survive. So how to invest in Bitcoin, I'm gonna just go through this briefly. This is uh, really fun, the four mistakes to avoid. Would you guys like to see this? Yes, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you guys applaud. Show your sense of, uh, if you made this mistake, please clap your hands, okay? The, the bigger the mistake you made, the louder you clap. Okay, are you guys ready? This is the last slide, okay. Number one mistake is indecisive to make the investment. When you first learn about Bitcoin, you forgot to invest in Bitcoin. Yes, I've made that mistake. Number two mistake is not buying enough. Yeah, seems like a lot of people there didn't buy enough, didn't buy early. Number three mistake is selling after a small gain. Yes, and you make big, <laughs> you sold your Bitcoin after 30% increase or after, after doubling. But what you can do is, you know, if you hold Bitcoin long, you can make 100x return. Okay, and number four mistake is selling Bitcoin during a panic crash. Have you guys done that? No? Wow, okay, this is a good crowd. All you newbie investors. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Come, Samida. Okay.